All right, thank you very much. Um, everybody hear me okay in the back? Um, so I was asked to talk about some work uh, from the Deepwater Horizon uh, incident that occurred in the Gulf of Mexico back in 2010. Um, but uh, first, thanks to the uh, uh, to the organizers. I always love to get back to UC Irvine. I love what you've done with the place. Uh, <laughs> congrats on the 200 million that you scored recently. Uh, so um, uh, today, this is a, a picture I took on scene uh, during the response to the Deepwater Horizon. We're about 500 meters away from the actively flowing well, um, studying the microbial activity in the deep subsurface. And I'll tell you all about that. So here's my outline of where I would like to go with this talk today. First, uh, I'm going to give you a bit of background, uh, bring you up to speed on what happened during this event. Uh, and then I'm going to try and address two of the major questions that uh, have lingered uh, both during and, and following this event. And the first is, where did the hydrocarbons actually go? And the second is, what happened to them? And I will talk about the work we've done in addressing those two questions, focused mainly on what was happening in the deep ocean, which was the area that we were uh, least certain about going into this event. And then if I have time, I'll, I'll talk about some directions as to where this has taken us. Um, so before I get there, uh, acknowledgments. Uh, I, this was a, a major effort, uh, a lot of uh, collaborators on this, and so a couple of key ones I've named here, John Kessler, Chris Reddy, Rich Camilli, Liz Kuzwinski, Ur Mezik, and Tom Ryerson, uh, as well as a number of postdocs and students out of my lab, Molly Redmond, uh, Sarah Bagby, Birch Fisher, Ellie Arrington, and Connor Love. I will put up um, a lot of our co-authors. There's actually about 70 now um, for these different papers that I'll, uh, I'll go through. And, uh, and funding, of course, uh, critical for this, um, NSF uh, through the RAPID program, DOE uh, also responded very rapidly, and then NOAA um, all helped us out with this. So um, the, uh, the Deepwater Horizon event occurred in uh, April of 2010. Uh, it occurred in the Gulf of Mexico, which is shown uh, down here uh, at the right. It was about 40 miles offshore at a water depth of about 1,500 meters where this happened. Um, so what actually happened, and I'll, I'll take a minute to, to try and explain the scenario. Um, the Deepwater Horizon was a mobile offshore drilling unit, a massive, massive drilling unit. Um, it had actually completed the drilling of the Macondo well. Uh, it was in uh, 1,500 meters of water, and it was so it had a drill string that went down 1,500 meters, and then it had drilled another 4,000 meters into the subsurface, and it had intersected an oil reservoir known as the Macondo Reservoir that was about 30 meters thick. So there's about uh, uh, 5,500 meters of water plus, um, plus sediment to hit this 30 meter thick uh, layer. The ambient hydrostatic pressure in that reservoir uh, is about uh, uh, 55, I'm sorry, 550 atmospheres, but the actual pressure, uh, because of the buildup of the hydrocarbons, is about 850 atmospheres. So there's about a, a 300 atmosphere uh, pressure difference between hydrostatic, that is 5,500 meters of water pushing down on you, and what was pushing back up. So they, uh, that, that means money in the oil industry. So they had uh, completed drilling this well, and they had put cement into the, uh, into the pipe, and they were trying to get out of there because they were over budget and, uh, and over time. And so they, uh, they put the cement in, and then because of their haste, they misinterpreted uh, a slight rise in pressure that was coming from their devices, and they went ahead and started removing all of the, the weight that they used to pressurize down that reservoir. Uh, and then the evening of April 20th, uh, that concrete plug gave way, and gas started shooting up that full 5,500 meters of pipe uh, up to the drilling rig. Uh, it found an ignition source, and the rest, uh, the rest is history, as they say. So the explosion occurred on April 20th. The, um, the rig went down on April 22nd. This picture was taken the 21st as it was burning. Um, and then when the rig fell to the seafloor, uh, it was realized that oil was still flowing, which never should have happened because there is a, uh, a safety mechanism known as a blowout preventer that has these blind shearing rams that seal together and are supposed to crimp off uh, any pipe that happens to be leaking. What had happened was that a piece of pipe from down within the, the hole itself had shot up and stuck into the blowout preventer. So there were two pieces of pipe. And when the blind shearing ramps actuated, they went a little sideways and left space for the oil to come shooting out. 
Um, so that uh, the fluids uh, were coming out at about 130 degrees Celsius, because uh, as we all know, uh, hell is hot down deep in the earth, um, and uh, and they were flowing out at a at a pretty rapid rate. And I have a video. Uh, if you were around in 2010 and watched the news or anything, you've probably seen these videos. But this is. Um, uh, the flow rate, uh, the flow of oil coming out of that wellhead. This was taken in early June after they had sheared um, the the pipe that was still connecting the the rig to the um, uh, to the well. Uh, and the flow rate here, uh, it's about uh, just to, to give you an example. Um, you could fill up um, the tank of a standard car in about a third of a second. Um, so we're talking about maybe 5,000 vehicles filling up over the course of this talk. Um, and uh, it's not just oil, but this is petroleum fluid. So it contains all of those raw petroleum products, which becomes very important uh, as we get into the biogeochemical response. So within, uh, I think within about three days, I was involved with this event in one way or another. I ultimately uh, participated in 10 expeditions uh, to go out there. And these are some of the images uh, that I took um, while we were out there. Uh, the bottom one is actually the Commandant of the Coast Guard taking a picture of us. I thought that was, that was kind of cool. Um, and then, uh, and then that's, uh, that's me over there with the current Commandant of the Coast Guard um, giving a press release about all the places they wanted us to sample. Uh, during this event. Um, okay, so um, that's a, a brief introduction uh, to what was happening during this event. And now I want to get into the meat of first, where did the hydrocarbons go, focusing on the deep subsurface, and then really getting into the, the areas that touch more on the microbiome of this event, that is what happened to these hydrocarbons. So uh, a key aspect of this event um, was apparent from day one, gas. So we knew this thing was happening, this blowout was happening at tremendous depth. We had no idea how much was coming out. We really had no idea what these petroleum fluids looked like. But if you have spent enough time studying uh, petroleum, which in Santa Barbara, if you've ever been there, we have plenty of petroleum, um, you know that there's quite a bit of gas that's associated with, um, with petroleum reservoirs. And so when gas is coming out um, from the seafloor at a depth of a mile, uh, you begin to think of solubility and gas hydrate as two of the major issues that you're going to, to worry about. Um, and so it's key to, to think about that because gases are soluble in water. They can dissolve, unlike oil, which is in, so largely insoluble in water. And so you're going to have um, separation that's going to become important on a fairly large scale for an event like this. Um, so the, the very first thing I did as I began to get involved was to try and make this point that gases were going to be critical. And I started um, uh, within about a week, uh, got this out as an opinion piece in Nature, making an argument that we could use methane gas in particular to quantify the flow rate. We could do this geochemically, and we could do it without um, being in at the wellhead, which was the big issue with determining flow rate at the time. Um, and so it, it was enough to get leverage to get us on ships and get out there. We didn't get to do exactly what we wanted, but, uh, but we got to, to do something. Um, but it's not just methane that was important. Um, it's one of my two favorite molecules. Ask me at, over wine and cheese what my other favorite molecule is. Um, <laughs> but uh, there are actually quite a few uh, aqueous soluble compounds in petroleum. So this is just a, a simple rank order abundance of the 40 most abundant compounds that came out of that well. And I've color coded them such that the red, green, and purple are all aqueous soluble at one level or another. Um, these are not siderophores. These are the actual structures, <laughs> Rachel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that came out so wrong up there. Uh, so as you see, a, a significant fraction of the petroleum that was emanating from that well is actually aqueous soluble, and it has to travel through a mile of the ocean uh, with ample opportunity to dissolve. And so that set up the, the first round of questions um, that we wanted to go after. So um, as we're thinking about how do we construct uh, some sort of a budget for hydrocarbons, this is the notion that we came up with. This is a notional hydrocarbon budget, not a national hydrocarbon budget. Um, and what we have is the emission of uh, order 4.2 million barrels of oil into the ocean. Uh, that's over 200 million gallons, for those of you who don't work in imperial, imperial barrel units. Um, 
the, uh, the, the question then became how much of that is partitioning and going to the ocean surface where we know there was plenty of oil and how much of that is getting trapped at depth in the ocean. Uh, and so that really became one of the driving questions for us is how much uh, and how were hydrocarbons ending up down in the deep ocean. So fortunately, uh, Scott Sokolowski and Eric Adams had published a very nice paper in 2010. Um, they ultimately shared the, uh, excuse me, published it in 20, uh, 2005. Um, in 2010, they shared the Ig Nobel with BP uh, with the citation of disproving the commonly held notion that oil and water don't mix. Um, and what they were able to show in their, their modeling effort is that if you have a buoyant plume of oil and gas that's, that's coming up from the deep ocean, it actually entrains water within that plume. And the whole plume moves up as a package because it has uh, less density because of all that oil and gas. So it gets pulled up through the ocean waters to some height. And then uh, it destabilizes as the plume spreads out. And those waters are naturally more dense. And they want to come back down to their natural density surface. And so that's what is demonstrated here is this fallback of water back to its natural density surface. And it will take with it whatever compounds are stuck in that water. And that would be anything that is aqueous soluble, saying that can truly dissolve in the aqueous phase. But also, it can take small droplets of oil. If you have oil droplets that are smaller than, say, 50 or 75 microns, those oil droplets can't naturally rise on their own. They lack uh, the sufficient buoyant force to break through the cohesive force of water. And if you have ambient mixing energy, they'll be held down. Same reason bacteria, individual bacteria, don't float or sink. Right? The ambient, ambient forces are too great. So uh, small oil droplets and anything soluble can be trapped and indeed were trapped in these layers. So as we went out and started studying what was going on, we were very interested in what was happening here. So here's a timeline that I provided. The, uh, the explosion uh, occurred on April 20th. July 15th is when the well was, was capped. So that's when flow ostensibly halted into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and then October 4th is a random date, because that was the end of the last cruise um, during this response phase. And what I've shown here are the different times that we were on scene, either me or members of my lab, um, studying what was going on. And I want to uh, highlight uh, two windows, this time window here in June uh, during the time of active flow. Uh, we were out around the wellhead. This is our sampling. This is a one kilometer scale bar, so we we're mainly within five or six um, miles of the well. Uh, and then later, between August and October, we spent quite a bit of time um, working our way throughout the Gulf. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the outflow of the Mississippi. This is Texas over here. This is Florida Panhandle. Um, and these are all the stations that we occupied uh, during, during those events. So uh, I'm going to talk about what happened during these two times and uh, a lot of inference about what happened between these times. So uh, during that first period in June, uh, we were focusing on the near field. What's happening uh, close in to where these hydrocarbons are, are emanating from the seafloor and where are these hydrocarbons ending up, which will set us up for understanding what happened to them. Um, and a couple of key things that we found. Uh, methane, uh, we can estimate from, uh, from our sampling, that greater than 99% of that methane was trapped at depths deeper than 800 meters in the water. And what did that look like? Well, this is a transect of six stations to the southwest of the wellhead. This is the wellhead here. Uh, so we're about five miles out from the wellhead. And what you see is this uh, intense uh, intrusion layer of hydrocarbons at uh, depths around 1,100 meters. And it varies a little bit. Uh, this is methane, but we saw similar patterns for things like ethane and propane that we were also looking at. Um, so uh, there, was, there were hydrocarbons throughout the water column. These are uh, maybe uh, 10 to 20 times ambient levels up here, but nothing compared to the, the 10,000 times ambient that we saw at depth. Um, then coming back uh, a couple of months later and tracking what happened to these plumes, um, we, uh, we looked through this sort of California-shaped um, sampling area here. And um, not to give away the next part, but we didn't find these same gases uh, dissolved. We didn't find the hydrocarbons. We were following traces of what was left after the microbes had had their way with all this. Uh, and so what did that look like? Well, th this is the sort of thing we were looking at. This is um, an oxygen profile. And this is a very typical oxygen profile all the way down through here until you get to here. And then there's this weird hitch in the profile 
um, which you simply don't see outside of this event. Um, so we call these oxygen anomalies, and they happen to co-occur with the fluorescence anomaly, which is shown here, which we're attributing the fluorescence anomaly, anomaly to residual oil and the oxygen anomaly to respiration. Um, but fortunately, we also uh, had uh, in our back pocket this particular compound. This is an anionic surfactant known as dioctyl sulfosuccinate. It was the main active ingredient of dispersant that was added at the wellhead. And we were also able to track that compound um, hundreds of miles from the well in these deep layers. So pretty concrete evidence that what we're seeing um, through these multi-proxy approaches is the residual of this, um, this deep sea plume. Um, so that's, uh, that's setting up for when we talk about the microbial activity and what happened in that plume. Uh, but then there's also the matter of the, the liquid oil and what happened to the liquid oil. Um, and this was far more enigmatic for several years. Um, but eventually, um, we managed to, to pull together enough data to tell a little bit of the story about it. Uh, the way we did this was by joining with the um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and working through the Natural Resource Damage Assessment, which is a legal framework, um, and developing study plans to go out and actually uh, sample at high, very high resolution using remotely operated vehicles um, the seafloor uh, throughout the, the northern Gulf of Mexico. And I, uh, many of my 10 expeditions were leading these damage assessment crews. Um, and so uh, there's no compound that is unique to the oil that came out from that well. There's nothing that is a smoking gun for Macondo oil. And so we had to develop a different approach to understanding where the oil went. So the first thing we needed was a proxy. And we had to use something that uh, was good for crude oil, but not uh, unique to Macondo because nothing was. We chose uh, this compound, 17-alpha-21 beta-C30 hopane, uh, which is a, a petroleum product that's derived ultimately from bacterial um, uh, hoponoids. And so this, is, um, this was shown to be a, a good recalcitrant compound during Exxon Valdez, to which you can geochemically reference. Um, and then what we did was to look through the thousands of samples that we had collected um, as part of the natural resource damage assessment and to develop a spatial argument looking around the well. And so we had expectations that if we're going to see a signal, it should be high near the well. Um, we should see elevated hoping on the very surface of the sediment, not deeper down in the sediment when you get into older times. This should be recent deposition. Uh, and it should be really patchy. And if you imagine sort of droplets or particles of oil that get ballasted and dropped to the seafloor, it should be very heterogeneous even within a small area. Uh, and so we were able to identify um, uh, samples that contained each of these. And you can see then the color coding here, and I'll, I'll blow this up in a minute. Um, the, uh, the sort of fuchsia-ish pink here uh, is the cumulative oil surface uh, uh, oiling at the sea surface. So that's where the oil went at the surface. And what we're seeing is this much, much smaller, this 3,200 square kilometer area that has much higher concentrations. Um, so just a little bit of the evidence for that. If we look at the surficial hopane, that is the hopane just in that surface layer, um, and look at that as a function of distance from the well, uh, you can see this very clear signal where you have much, much higher uh, uh, concentrations of, of petroleum uh, out to about 40 kilometers, and then you tend to get much, much lower concentrations. You can add another dimension to that um, and ask about the, the depth of the seafloor at which the sample was collected. And you see that y you end up with a bit of a bullseye for where the where the oil from this um, event really fell to the seafloor, at least um, what we think is the oil from the deep ocean, these intrusion layers, because there were volatile compounds in many of these samples. And if they had gone to the surface and, and refluxed and fallen back down, there wouldn't be the same volatiles because they would have easily gone to the atmosphere. Um, so what did that look like? Um, it, uh, it, it, it contours out something like this, a 3,200 square kilometer area with some pretty serious hot spots, but contaminated uh, at some level throughout. And then we published this a couple of years ago um, in, uh, in PNAS. Um, OK, so that's setting the stage. We have oil that uh, uh, partitioned, and some of it solubilized uh, into deep plume. Some of it fell to the seafloor. But what, what really happened to it, uh, and, and what did the microbes do? Um, so one, uh, 
the, the first way that we, we approached this uh, was really back in, in June, looking at these deep plumes. Remember, this was these are the locations that we did sampling of the deep water. And this is what oxygen profiles looked like at that time. What we have on the x-axis is the concentration of oxygen. The y-axis is water depth. This is all very typical oxygen profile for this part of the ocean. What's atypical here is this, um, this anomaly or this sag. And some of these got very deep. Um, meaning the oxygen was, was being removed from that water very quickly before mixing could um, bring it back in. Um, so we focused in on these areas where, um, where oxygen was missing. And I'll walk through the, the geochemical um, arguments of, of what we did. Um, we first had to, to define a baseline and something recalcitrant, which it turned out at this point methane was the, the best um, molecule that we could use. And then we referenced things like propane and ethane to methane to define what that ratio should be um, in the water. And then we calculated a deviation. How much propane, in this case, are we missing? Um, and what we did is to then compare that to the amount of oxygen that was missing, doing all this from, from the geochemistry. Uh, and that gets us an estimate of the fraction of respiration that is coming from propane. Now, of course, this had to be heavily validated. And so we went out um, with all sorts of different uh, stable and radioisotopes to do this. Uh, looking at the natural abundance, carbon-13, on, on things like propane and ethane, uh, doing uh, tracer experiments where we actually add 100% C13 uh, to fresh samples shipboard and measure the metabolic products to demonstrate metabolism, um, looking using tritium-labeled methane to track the rate at which methane is, or in this case, wasn't being uh, oxidized, and then lastly, using stable isotopes on methane to, to estimate the total amount of consumption that could have happened. Um, and all of that showed methane at this point in time in June of 2010 during active flow was recalcitrant, uh, but it showed that propane was not. And when we compare these anomalies, so now looking at the oxygen anomaly on the y-axis to the propane anomaly on the x-axis, what we find uh, is a, a pretty reasonable correlation. And if you take that to its natural conclusion, um, that up to 60% of respiration of the oxygen decline uh, could be attributed to propane at this point in time. Uh, ethane was also a major contributor. And while we didn't measure the other natural gases, we think butane and pentane probably made up the, um, the remainder. Um, so fairly clear evidence that at this point in time, these oxygen anomalies were actually being driven by the natural gases, which keep in mind are the most abundant things in the oil, and they're soluble. So um, that all made sense to us. Um, methane, uh, during, active, during the time of active flow when we were looking, was uh, abundant and it was not being consumed very quickly. Um, but surprisingly, when we, when we started looking again uh, in August, now just a couple of months, we had to write a paper, uh, that's why it's blue here. Um, when we got back in, uh, and started looking again in August on these three cruises, what we found was that there was absolutely no methane. Uh, in fact, methane was subambient. It had been drawn down below the levels that we would normally uh, see. Uh, 700 measurements that all came out at zero. Um, there were four, four people working around the clock on two instruments shipboard, all zeros all the time. Um, and, uh, but what we were able to, to find was that um, uh, while there was no methane there, the, uh, the integrated oxygen anomaly was uh, something of order a million tons of, oxygens were, of oxygen was missing out of the water in this deep plume horizon. So we could calculate the total amount of respiration that had happened uh, between 1,000 and 1,300 meters, which gave, gives us a pretty good idea of what the total uh, community um, metabolism was. Okay, so um, the, of course, what we're here to talk about are the microbes, and uh, and I'll tell you a little, couple little stories about um, what we found there, um, and and this is, this is all published. Um, we posted a, a pair of science papers in um, 2011 and and in 2010. Uh, the first on propane uh, and ethane, and the second on what happened to the methane. Um, and what we found is that um, uh, during, the, uh, during the time of active flow, that it, at least for the, the samples that had the greatest amount of, of respiration going on, um, that they had incredibly simple um, microbial communities. Um, we, we heard earlier about the complexity of natural uh, communities in some circumstances, and this is a case where you throw a perturbation and it's a foot race. It's almost like a cultivation. Um, it's whoever can grow up fastest um, and then die off quick. Um, and so in this case, we saw two organisms dominated a uh, majority of our samples, and they were Coelia from the genus Coelia, uh, and then from the genus Cycloclasticus. And I'll tell you a little bit more about those in a, in a minute. Um, 
once uh, once we get out to to the flow of stopping on July 15, and we get out into September, uh, the community begins to to start looking a little bit more like the native community, but still with higher than expected levels of some organisms. And down here, I've highlighted Methylic Acaceae, which is a, a well-known um, methanotroph. Uh, but also other organisms that we suspect are either involved in carbon transfer, such as methylotrophs, or in uh, getting in and consuming the biomass that was generated um, from the, uh, the primary uh, responders. Okay, so uh, we also at this time we're looking uh, at, uh, uh, at the community using stable isotope probing, and uh, just a couple of, of quick results here. One, when we, when we add methane um, and do stable isotope probing shipboard during the response, um, we see that the, the heavy fractions are dominated by methylic Acaceae, so that's not surprising. They're a, a well-known methanotroph. Um, what we saw uh, in this case uh, when we added uh, uh, ethane and propane is that we had a, a dominance of Coelia, um, but a few other things from the Oceanosporales. Um, and so that, that led us, I think, a little bit astray in our thinking um, that maybe Coelia was actually the one that was responsible for consuming some of these natural gases. And I got to speed up. And that was, um, that was Molly Redmond's work published in PNAS. But the story has, has taken a very interesting, exciting turn. Um, and this is a 2017 paper, a collaborative work with Nicole Dublier's group um, in, uh, uh, at the MPI in Bremen. And uh, what, uh, what, her, uh, what Max uh, Ruben Bloom has found is that, in fact, some of these cycloplasticus uh, are, are gas degraders. And uh, he's able to very uh, definitively show this. And down here is some transcriptomic work. Uh, these are, are symbionts in the gill tissues of mussels in the deep ocean where natural gas is, is emanating. And it's been known for a long time that uh, there are methane consumers and sulfide consumers that uh, live in these gill tissues. Uh, but here, uh, Nicole's group was able to show that, uh, that cycloclasticus uh, are there as well. And not only that, uh, they're active in degrading the natural gases. And so uh, they are using a, a divergent form of a hydrocarbon monooxygenase. And this has now opened up an interesting view of the cycloclasticus. And I apologize, this is illegible. These are all the sequenced cycloclasticus. They all have this little purple thing here. That's a, that indicates that they have the genes for aromatic hydrocarbon degradation, thus their name cycloclasticus. Uh, the, uh, the symbionts do not have any of those genes. Instead, they have the genes for degrading natural gas, which we're now recognizing as these particulate monooxygenases, copper-containing enzymes. Uh, and then when we look at, at uh, single cell genomes from the Deepwater Horizon, we find a hybrid. We have things that have both of these capabilities genetically encoded in them, whereas these do not have the gas capability and these do not have the aromatic capability. But during Deepwater Horizon, we had things that had both, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, OK, so what happened to the, um, the actual liquid oil that fell to the seafloor? Um, this was uh, some work by Sarah Bagby, published earlier this year in PNAS. Um, where we, uh, we parsed out the, uh, the different regimes of, of contamination, so light contamination, heavy contamination, and something in the middle, and worked out the kinetics. And we did this for 130 different compounds. This is just meth methylmethylbenzothiophene, so just one of those 130 compounds. Um, and what we find is that it's, it's not a simple answer because when you have only minor amounts of contamination, the kinetics are much more rapid. When you have heavy contamination, the kinetics are much, much slower. So the interpretation is that there's some sort of inhibition when you begin packing this oil together in larger particles. Maybe it's surface area to volume, or maybe it's something else going on. Um, but you go from a case where after 500 days, this is a time series, um, you've only got about 7.6% of this particular compound left uh, in a lightly contaminated sample, uh, whereas in a heavily contaminated sample, you've got about 70% of that compound remaining. So it's far more recalcitrant situationally when the contamination burden is higher in the sediment. Um, I don't have time to go through this model. It would take all the rest of my time. Um, that's just coupling the physical, chemical, and biological um, in the water column to understand how the, the motion of the water, the chemical input, and the growth of the microbial community could explain a lot of what was going on. But I wanted to take a minute to talk about now, looking forward, where is this taking us? Um, so this is um, uh, some work from Ellie Arring Arrington, a PhD student in my lab, and it's about the geographic priming. Um, of hydrocarbon degrading communities. And what Ellie was, was doing was looking at this, uh, the black are seeps in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this is from 2015. 
And she did a transect looking at how microbial bloom response changed as you went from areas where there wasn't much seepage into areas where there's far more intense seepage. And what she finds is that uh, for things like pentane, methylcyclopentane, and methylcyclohexane, that you get blooms within one to two weeks when you're in somewhere near a, a area of seepage, not, not really close in, but several miles within uh, a broader area. But then once you get out um, away from natural seepage, it can take uh, well over a month to get a bloom and out in the Atlantic, sometimes you don't get blooms at all. Um, showing that there is some relationship to, uh, to this priming of the communities where you have a source input, they grow, um, and, and there's a certain sense to that. Um, but what was kind of cool and what we've been chasing is that she's getting some interesting organisms that are coming up. Uh, first, uh, Cycloclasticus we're seeing again, and, and again we think they're using this, um, this hydrocarbon monooxygenase. Uh, that we're trying to track down. But we're also finding more even uh, di more divergent hydrocarbon monooxygenases. And one of the organisms that's blooming on the cyclic compounds is the c one bo 45 genus, which we think we now have just about in isolation, but they hate plates. Um, but you can see that they, uh, they bloom to, uh, this is effectively 100% um, of this uh, as yet uncultivated um, genus. Um, and so we're, we're trying to understand which organisms bloom under which conditions, which are going after these complex oil compounds, as opposed to those that are going after the natural alkanes that are produced by cyanobacteria. So cyanobacteria was shown um, very nicely by a paper by Lee Smith et al. in 2015 um, that they produce pretty significant amounts of alkanes, which are also major components of oil. They do so uh, seemingly for purposes of uh, membrane stabilization and fluidity. Uh, but globally, they're probably producing more alkane uh, than there is oil coming into the ocean, period. And so ecologically, this may be a far more important um, uh, issue, and it may also be seeding a lot of the activity, at least for certain kinds of compounds structurally. So we've been chasing this down. Um, this was a, a forward that we wrote for the Lee Smith paper in PNAS. Uh, this is data from Connor Love, a graduate student in my lab, um, out in the, uh, in the Sargasso Sea, the oligotrophic North Atlantic, and he developed a method first to quantify the concentrations of these N-alkanes uh, dilute in seawater. And this is, um, I think, the first good depth distribution ever for these compounds. Um, and you can see that, that they definitely have a, a strongly structured depth distribution, and that was true um, over a lot of these cyanobacterially dominated environments. Um, but he also developed a, a method for, um, for quantifying the rate of productivity. And uh, this is work in progress, but uh, at time zero, uh, this is uh, the amount of uh, pentadecane, that's NC15 alkane. Uh, but after 30 hours, you can see uh, pretty significant production of this stuff um, going on. And so we, um, we think we can now quantify, um, at least estimate the true global productivity of these things, and we're working on the consumption side. How tightly coupled is this production to the, to the bacterial consumption? And you can see the stuff doesn't seem to be accumulating anywhere else but the surface, so um, we think that, that there may be some tight coupling. Um, and then my, my last slide I will skip because I see my time is up. Um, we've also been very interested in the, the issue of solid phase and flocks and how, um, how these different phases are impacting the activity of the organisms. Um, and so this is, a, um, uh, this is a matrix looking at different temperatures versus alkanes and looking at the wax transition point. Um, and its effect on metabolism. And you can see that clearly when you wax out, you have a tremendous effect um, on, uh, on metabolism. And we've been trying to, uh, to put that together with, with these flocks that we observe and thinking about how did that oil get to the seafloor. And this flock is negatively buoyant. This grew on pentane. So an organism growing on pentane can actually drag things to the seafloor. Okay, so um, with that, I will, um, I will conclude um, by saying that the discharge we talked about went to uh, deep water for dissolved uh, soluble compounds. There was seafloor deposition, um, and that microbes were absolutely key in degrading a lot of these compounds, um, but they, they take a little bit of a hit when you have too much of it there. So lower concentrations degrade more quickly. And with that, I will thank you for your attention. And questions? Yes. You're All right, so, so if you are in a situation where you go to oil wells and place it for the you would expect that if you are oil well, well, that's a good thing.
No, I mean, I, okay, so uh, it's so the first part's not entirely true. Seepage is not all we, you don't always get seepage where you have oil wells. There are many places where you simply don't. So the Gulf of Mexico is leaky, California is leaky in terms of oil coming up. Uh, but other places, Saudi Arabia, I think, is not so leaky, and offshore Brazil, I think, is is also not so leaky from what I've from what I know so far. Um, so I, I, you know, just just to sort of separate those out. But um, if you are in an environment that has been um, exposed previously, you will probably have some memory effect from that. Um, so I, I think you know the take home is don't spill. Um, but if you're going to spill, um, there are certainly some places that are that are better to spill than others. Yeah, Denise. So the, a spill probably never happen again in the future, but does. <laughs> uh, I, I got an email yesterday from a, a reporter in uh, uh, in Greece where they apparently had a big spill, but maybe not after tomorrow. But well, what's the application of your work to the response for future spills? Is, is yeah, so the um, yeah, application response is, is a very interesting question. And, uh, you know, what we have learned from these spills is that every spill is different, period. You never see the same spill twice. And this, this is the motto of the response community. Um, you just, you never have the same spill. So um, what we're doing, or one of the things that we're doing is we, we engage very heavily with the response community. I've been on, on two NAS um, panels to deal with this very issue of how do you take that science and inform um, the response community. And, and the bottom line is that you know, the, the more we learn, the more we understand specific situations, and we can inform on those situations. But then every time something new comes, we're still learning. So I, I think we can make a lot of predictions depending on um, what, depending on how similar something is, but then we also have to recognize when things are different. Um, so I, I think that the, um, you know, the, in the case of, of this event, um, they had to get to a point where they said, okay, when is the cleanup more difficult um, than just letting it sit in place? And, and that was always the balance. And so that's one area that we can help in. And say, okay, here's what we predict your, your curve will be for you know, these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. We can, we can do that sort of thing. But uh, you know, to clean up uh, 3,200 square kilometers in a mile deep, um, you know, that's, that's going to be more expensive than hurricane damage. Right? I remember learning that there were these detergents that they were using to kind of help, and I was wondering if what you learned that that was a bad idea to learn, or it's like just let the microbes do their job and it might be better. Yeah. So, um, so right. So one of the two uh, uh, National Academy panels I'm, I've been on uh, is active right now, and we are tasked with this very question. Um, so, uh, in about two weeks, I go back, uh, meeting in Florida this time, to talk about this very issue. Um, the uh, and so, and I can't talk about that deliberation, but I can say uh, a little bit about um, why it was added and and what the what the benefits were. Uh, and what the, the, the downside may have been. The, uh, the real issue, the reason that, that they were added, their dispersers are added in two places. About a million liters added at the sea surface and about 800,000 liters added directly at the wellhead. Um, the, the surface I'm not going to get into because there have been books written about that, but, but the deep application was the new application. It had never been done in that way before. And what was happening is that uh, all this oil was coming up directly above the wellhead. You know, maybe get turned a little bit one way or another. So as they're trying to, to perform their intervention efforts and seal the well, um, there's oil coming up at your ship. And that's an extremely dangerous situation for a number of reasons, least of all is the people who are doing the response. Um, and so I was not seen. I mean, I got, I got you know, we had gas masks and, and everything, but you, know, you still don't want to be out there and fully exposed to that. And what was happening early on is that they would have to, had to call off work more often than not because the, particularly the, the volatiles um, were, were too intense for them. And when they started adding the dispersant, what they found was that the, this dispersant, and I showed you the, the structure of the dioxyl sulfosuccinate, it reduces the interfacial tension um, between oil and water. And so it allows it to break up into smaller droplets. Um, after seven years of modeling, we're finally realizing that the droplet size distribution that came out of that uh, didn't actually trap oil at depth. At least it seems like it didn't trap oil at depth, but it made it small enough that its rise time was much, much longer. It took a day or so to rise instead of, say, five or six hours. So instead of coming up where the responders were working, it would come up over here where people weren't working. And then that sped up the response. And that was really the decision why they chose to use it, because when they added it, they could work. 
and try and address the issues at the wellhead. And when they didn't add it, they couldn't. Um, but at the same time, there, there, were, you know, there was the argument, maybe it's accelerating biodegradation. And that was a, a reason. That's actually one of the reasons it got approved and it made it through NOAA and EPA is because they thought higher surface area to volume ratio, maybe it's going to biodegrade more quickly. I think that question is still out. Um, I don't think it had as much impact on biodegradation rate because the dispersant, it, it created those droplets, but the dispersant actually dissolves into water. It's soluble, at least the, the components like the, the DOS. Um, so those droplets, they may take longer and they may perform that certain function, but they still, when they end up at the surface, they don't have much dispersant even left in them. Uh, and then they're joining the surface slick. So that's not going to have a, much of an impact, I think, on biodegradation because it's not doing much to, to where that oil ultimately um, is ending up. So uh, at the same time, what is the toxicity of it? Um, that, uh, you know, that's an issue that I, I think has gotten a tremendous amount of, of um, uh, air time. Um, but the reality is that the levels we were measuring were six orders of magnitude lower than, than where you see toxicity thresholds. Um, so uh, I haven't seen much evidence that, that that particular dispersant created toxicity, at, uh, at least yeah, ecotoxicity. All right. I think I'm going to cut us off there because Dave's around all, uh, all day. So thank all you day. very much. Right, and I can you. smell the pizza out there.